So objective of today's class. Uh, all the enzyme part, enzyme action, mechanism, classification, up to inhibition. Now, uh, second, we need to understand uh, a very important concept of uh, receptor. And to understand receptor, we We'll take the example of G protein coupled receptor. G protein coupled receptor. Very important topic, even in Campbell and any other book you'll find. And we'll try to link this G protein coupled receptor with uh, NCRT topic, which is uh, hormone mechanism of hormone action. So although in NCRT, it is not directly mentioned that uh, G protein coupled receptor is required, but uh, the diagrams they have given, it is actually GPCR. So mechanism of hormone action. Um, okay, so that's fine. So there's a lot of topic. Actually, enzyme is the most uh, vast topic here. So let's start with the first uh, of whatever we have completed in our last class of enzyme. I will start from that section. So let me uh, recapitulate uh, this. Uh, a small section of the enzyme which we have seen in the last class. So we know that enzymes are protein in nature. Uh, usually 99 point, say 9% enzymes are protein in nature. But there are around 0.1% of enzymes which are actually ribosomal RNAs, rRNAs. That's why we also call it ribozyme. Now from from our knowledge of protein, we know that usually enzymes are tertiary protein. But there are some enzymes which are quaternary protein. That means when the enzymes are quaternary protein, that means the enzymes are having more than one polypeptide chain. So tertiary protein means the whole enzyme is composed of a single polypeptide chain, one polypeptide chain, and which is the uh, which is likely most of the cases are like this only. However, four degree proteins or quaternary proteins, this is composed of more than one, more than one polypeptide chain. And when such type of enzymes are found, we usually call it allosteric enzyme. And those enzymes have uh, numerous binding sites. So usually one enzyme binds with one substrate, but allosteric enzymes has more than one binding site. Now, what are the names? We'll come to that part later. What are the names of other binding sites? So we'll come to that. Obviously, each enzyme, so one enzyme has only one active site. Then all other sites are called allosteric sites. So if enzyme has like seven binding site so only one will be the active site other six will be allosteric sites allosteric sites so 
So now we know that Emil Fischer, a scientist, uh, provided a very basic yet effective model of enzyme action, and that is lock and key model. And from our last class, we know that lock and key, in lock and key, this is nothing, a just a protein chain. And we know that protein chain has N terminal, C terminal. So this is just a protein chain with its most effective or the most reactive uh, amino acids. Most reactive means the amino acids with uh, reactive side chains, say reactive R group. So amino acid has a variable group called R. So with the reactive R group, those amino acids are uh, uh, say concentrated in one region of of that uh, tertiary protein structure and that region is called the active site so when we whenever we draw an enzyme and we draw the active site like a pocket in the, in, in the enzyme so that active site contains those reactive amino acids means the amino acids with the most reactive R group or the variable group. So the, there, so I gave some examples like if, if the R groups are having say positive charge, like in this case, there is positive charge. So there are three amino acids and all those three amino acids are having positive charge here. So, and there are some amino acids with negative charge here. That means only a specific type of substrate which corresponds to the negative. So suppose this is a substrate S and it has positive in this side. So there are four positive. It can easily uh, be attracted towards this region which has four negative. And also it has, it should bear some negative charge on the upper surface, which will correspond to the positive charge on the active site. So this, this substrate is very, you know, this, this, substrates, this substrate can be a perfect fit to that uh, pocket or to that active site of enzyme. However, if, if, if there is a little bit of manipulation in the substrate, say there is uh, some negative charge on the lower surface and some uh, positive charge on the upper surface, this substrate will not be able to bind here because this, this negative will be repelled by that negative. Similarly, this positive will be repelled by that positive. So this substrate cannot bind to the active set all, even with having uh, almost same shape. So this, so this was the example I gave in the last class. So which uh, mentions that how a lock and key type of model works. So, uh, so let's let's see some other models, some other effective models of enzyme action, and then we can move towards activation energy. So there is another model called induced fit model. So in induced fit model, the active site is not permanent or fixed. The active site of an enzyme is
uh, not a fixed pocket or area. And it appears in a response to interaction in response to interaction with say uh, the specific substrate so here there is a concept of a buttressing region and catalytic region so if this is say if this is an enzyme this enzyme has a specific uh, region, say so this area, and say so that area. These regions will be called buttressing region or group. So this buttressing region of the enzyme interacts with substrate. So, so substrate never directly interact with the active site. So there is no active site in this enzyme as per induced fit model. So uh, which was uh, provided by, uh, so which was given by a scientist named uh, Koshland. Some Coastland, I just maybe Frederick Coastland. So it's enough to know just one name. So Coastland uh, has given this uh, model. According to this, the enzyme has a uh, region called buttressing region, which interacts with the substrate. Now, if the substrate is uh, specific enough for the uh, enzyme, say this is one substrate this triangular, mm, this is another substrate, say circular, this is another substrate, say square shaped. Say I uh, am giving this like three names, S1, S2, S3. So there are say three substrate. And say I know that uh, S3 uh, is the specific substrate. So if, if S3 is the specific substrate, say I know that, now, when uh, your S1 will interact to the buttressing group of that enzyme, there will be no change, no change in the enzyme. Similarly, when S2 will interact with the buttressing region, there will be no change in the enzyme. So, no change in enzyme shape. But as soon as this specific substrate, S3, interacts with the uh, buttressing region of the enzyme, you'll find that some changes appearing in this region. A change is induced due to this uh, S3. That's why it is called induced and then the substrate will be fitted into the enzyme. So fit. Now, now the change which we'll find in this enzyme, the change will be very specific to that substrate. So you'll find that a say box shaped pocket appeared. And where this S3 will be attracted towards. So now the next uh, uh, events are like, like that of lock and key only. 
but the region has been induced by the substrate. So this is now enzyme substrate complex being formed. And then enzyme product and all. So the so these are the two models. Just the region where change appears, that region is called catalytic region. So there is buttressing region and there is catalytic region. Catalytic region changes into active site. So now the basic mechanism of enzyme action is very simple that the enzyme and substrate has affinity towards each other. Not the enzyme, uh, the active side of the enzyme. So specifically, the active side has affinity. Active side and the substrate. S means here substrate. So has affinity towards each other. That's why there is initial binding. So there is initial binding between two. And we call it enzyme substrate complex. So as you can notice that the first step is kind of reversible. So it can... Uh, detach any time. So this is the easy uh, easy process. You can detach it, enzyme and substrate. But once enzyme substrate complex is formed, there is an irreversible uh, change in this complex. So the <clears throat> interaction, so the interaction as we have seen in the last class, so the interaction between uh, these this, uh, regions, means the regions of the active site and the substrate proceeds in such a way that the three-dimensional configuration of the protein chain, say alpha helix or beta pleated sheets, protein change, uh, protein chain changes. So the interaction between active site and substrate slowly changes the configuration of protein uh, chain. Protein chain means the enzyme shape. So as enzyme shape is changing, due to the interaction, it forces the substrate to change in a specific direction. So substrate will change in a specific, so a specific kind of reaction will occur because we'll see that the in, in chemistry, the main problem is 
when a reaction proceeds, a reactant can pass through a various number of intermediate uh, states. So, so say this is a reaction. Is say a very simple reaction A to B. But while proceeding, A passes through a number of intermediate stages. And depending on the energy of those intermediate chain uh, states, so depending on the energy of, of those intermediate states, uh, the rate of the reaction will be decided. Say there is an intermediate state, say called uh, A star, say something is called A hash, say uh, uh, something could say A double prime, something like this. Say just different, these are different intermediate chemical states. So in any reaction, any chemical passes through various uh, intermediate chemical states. Now, the, the energy required to achieve those states are different. And then it will again pass to B. So what enzyme does? Enzyme just forces the substrate to change in a specific di direction. So enzyme actually chooses like only one, uh, say, say enzyme will only <coughs> allow the substrate to pass through, say, uh, the third one, which I have highlighted here, say, A double dash, just uh, a name I provided here. So, so enzyme just allows only one intermediate state so that the reaction can occur very faster. So as enzyme shape is changing, it forces the substrate to change in a very specific direction. And in this way, substrate changes into product and the complex changes into enzyme product complex. Substrate changes into product. And ES complex, which was enzyme substrate complex, now changed into EP complex. Now here is the catch. When the substrate converted into product, this product, say so this B, has no affinity towards the active site of enzyme. So A was having, say, high affinity, affinity to active site of enzyme, and B has no affinity to active site. So once the conversion has been completed, now the product has no affinity to active site. And, and so the <clears throat> product detaches from enzyme and enzyme turns back to its original state. So product is now detached. And enzyme is now in original state because the uh, trigger point which changed its structure is no more uh, present. Okay, so I have few messages here. Let me check. Anish is asking why the change is not happening in the buttressing region. Okay, so why is kind of a... Uh, Oh. So 
why is kind of a very uh, philosophical question, right? So if you ask me like, this reaction is occurring in that way, so why, um, I mean, obviously uh, till now, whatever knowledge we have gained regarding protein structure and uh, interaction of the side chains, uh, based on you can easily find out some way that uh, why it couldn't have happened like, uh, maybe uh, the hinge region of protein. So it will be very detailed kind of like the there are some stable structure in a protein. There are some unstable structure in a protein. Um, say there are more beta pleated sheet in those regions and there are like more uh, domains on the uh, uh, cat catalytic group region. So it based on there, there are so many structural possibilities that you can easily come with a conclusion that of why something can uh, uh, change in a particular way in a protein because there are millions of ways a protein can uh, a protein can be designed. You know there are some AI applications now just to design different proteins in uh, before doing a lab experiment. So uh, I don't. Maybe you can get some answer from that. Rishabh is asking, sir, reaction occurs fast for intermediates requiring high energy or those requiring low energy. Obviously, uh, enzyme will support a, as a, a intermediate which, which have very lower uh, uh, energy requirement. That's why the reaction is occurring so fast, right? Okay. So no more questions, so I can turn to you now. So, uh, so you can easily uh, sort it out why uh, this, this simple, simple concept, enzyme plus substrate, and then ES, and then EP, and then E plus P, and the E is now, enzyme is now unchanged as product has been detached. So this enzyme can again go and start another cycle of uh, catalysis. So the same enzyme, so there is no change in the enzyme now, just substrate is being changed to product. So the whole cycle can be written in this way, that enzyme has been changed to product, sorry. Substrate has been changed to product with the help of an enzyme because this is unchanged from here to here. Although it was changed in between. Okay. So now the concept of activation energy. Activation energy. So if we just uh, see the graph from NCRT, in NCRT class 11 biology, you can find a simple curve where uh, the y-axis is, you can take it as a free energy curve, free energy, or maybe in book, it is written as potential energy. But whether you are taking it as Gibbs free energy or you are saying that this is a potential energy, both are completely fine. So say the potential energy of a molecule, uh, say a molecule A is here. So this is, a, <coughs> this is the potential energy of a molecule A. And A changes into B. And the reaction is, say, del G negative from our first class. If del G is negative, that means this free energy of the product is higher or lower? Lower, sir. Lower. lower. So say the, say B is lower. So this is the, level of uh, energy of B. 
level of energy of B. Now, the reaction could have proceeded like simple from A to B if, if this uh, x axis is time. But <laughs> reaction never proceeds like this. Otherwise, uh, means say in atmosphere, there are so many, uh, so much of carbon dioxide. And also thanks to global warming, there are a lot of uh, carbon dioxide now than 100 years back. And there is like ocean surface or any water surface. So if <clears throat> any reactions would have occurred like this, then every time means water comes in contact with carbon dioxide and the reaction could have proceeded and the uh, outcome would be carbonic acid. So all the water would turn into carbonic acid, which is not the case. Although the uh, del G value here is also negative. So, so what happens? The reaction should proceed via some intermediate, like say, uh, to change from A to B, there should be say A star, which is the intermediate. And to reach that intermediate, first, the potential energy or the free energy of A should increase say to A star. And if anyhow we can increase the free energy of that molecule to this level, then it will proceed to be spontaneously. So this is the So this is the basic uh, rule of uh, proceeding of a uh, reaction. So every intermediate state, or maybe in book it is written as transition state, has high energy requirement. Now any substrate, as, as I have said earlier, that any substrate has a lot of uh, transition state. It's not like that it can proceed in, in only, a, it means it can proceed through a single transition state all the time. There are different types of intermediate states. It depends on the environment, which one it supports. Now as enzyme supports or enzyme forces, so, with million years of evolution, the enzymes became so specific that it it is very uh, uh, what to say very uh, efficient for one uh, molecule to convert into the product molecule. So here. Uh, So here, uh, this molecule A is converting into B, but it should pass through a transition state A star, which has very high energy requirement. Now this high energy requirement, this requirement is called, so this extra energy from the level of uh, the energy of substrate, this, this is called activation energy. So we need to activate the substrate in order to proceed the reaction. Activation energy. So there is a very important statement which states that enzyme never changes. Enzyme never changes. del G value of a reaction.
और फ्री और जस्ट फ्री एनर्जी चेंज ऑफ ए रिएक्शन so enzyme will never touch uh, that change if you look in <coughs> this curve the energy of b and the energy of a if you just find out the difference this difference is del g value enzyme will never change this difference enzyme only changes the extra energy which required by a to reach say a star or the transition state and this even without enzyme or with enzyme this value remains same so this is same with or without enzyme okay so enzyme never changes del g value of the reaction now <clears throat> enzyme lowers activation energy so enzyme lowers the activation energy of a reaction how it lowers that we i have already explained here so there are many intermediate states enzyme only supports that intermediate state which can be achieved with a very low energy requirement okay so there are many intermediate states enzyme structure or the active site only supports that specific uh intermediate which can be uh, achieved with a very low energy requirement and all, it also direct uh, the substrate to go through that that intermediate so all the other groups in the uh, active site uh, uh, what it does it directs the substrate to move through that specific intermediate state now this is a very uh, simple uh, diagram to understand this activation energy concept so as you can see the reactants so here all the reactants are slowly so you can say the reactants are uh, juggling so all the reactants are vibrating here so sometimes so as uh, as i have said like this water and carbon dioxide are always in contact even in ocean surface in any water surface but they are not forming h2co3 carbonic acid but sometimes they are forming so maybe in 10000 interaction one reaction is happening so one time this h2co3 is being formed so this is what they are explaining in this way that all the reactants are juggling all the time sometimes uh, one or two jumps and comes out of this barrier and form product but <clears throat> but here you can see the statement that at the temperatures of most organism only a small proportion of the molecules have that much kinetic energy to overcome that barrier so sometimes some molecules just equal or exceeds the activation energy so that's why say out of 10000 say out of 1 1 lakh uh, interaction one or two sometimes passes that barrier so now now the function the uh, <coughs> liability of enzyme is to lower lower this barrier so that most of the molecules can pass it with their normal uh, energy
Okay, so uh, this is the concept of activation energy. Now we can move to uh, activation and then just fit. And then the factors. Okay, so the factors controlling uh, enzyme activity. Uh, any question? Anisha is asking, sir, how enzymes keep themselves unchanged despite the changing of the product? See, the product is uh, insignificant in front of the whole structure of the enzyme. So you can uh, imagine it like a... Uh, uh, to say no, yes. there are so many things to say but you can imagine it like a uh, like a rubber uh, say soft jelly or rubber type of structure where you have just uh, thrown a ball into that wall and the ball uh, uh, ball is like for a big wall that small ball is very insignificant I don't know that this example is uh, valid or not I'm just thinking about all the uh, exceptions but yeah so so with time, due to the internal uh, recoiling force of the bigger wall, automatically they uh, the wall will push the ball away, even if it is like bound to it, say the jelly-like area. And then slowly the structure of the wall will bounce back and it will regain its original conformation. So enzyme, enzyme is a very big structure. So it has a lot of support from inside too. Even if a substrate binds to it and changes and changes smaller uh, areas in that active site, when when the substrate or when the product will be removed from that uh, uh, active site, the other areas of the enzyme will push the uh, uh, active site region and the active site will again regain its original conformation. Uh, I think means I hope I could explain it maybe. Just tell me something. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, factors. So factors of the enzyme activity, uh, simple, just there are um, three important factors, temperature, uh, pH, and uh, substrate concentration. So I'll not go to that much details. Maybe I should go to details of substrate concentration, but I'll uh, provide some questions on the basis of substrate concentration so that uh, the extra uh, theory that I, I won't be able to cover now will be covered through those questions. So, so basically this temperature, uh, you know, at low temperature, uh, active site is more rigid. And at high temperature, the active site is Uh, 
not stable. So the very high temperature active site is constantly changing its uh, because there are a lot of uh, molecular vibration. So the active site is not that stable to uh, remain bound to a substrate. And that very low temperature active site is so rigid that sometimes substrate cannot uh, properly enter and then uh, uh, remain bound. So as the molecular vibration is like very, uh, uh, very much decreased. So there is a simple parabolic curve So you'll find so if this is uh, if the y axis is enzyme activity and the x axis is temperature, so there should be a range of temperature when the enzyme activity is very uh, prominent. Very good. This, so this range is also called optimum range, optimum temperature range. So for every living organism, there is an optimum temperature range. So say in case of human, let's say uh, 36, to 36 degrees Celsius to say 39 degrees Celsius. So that so that there's a optimum temperature range for human beings. Similarly for pH, pH would be like very specific for tissues or organs. Sometimes some organs are having different pH than other, like, like in case of in human uh, digestive system, we can find in stomach uh, pH is different, whereas in small intestine pH is different. So pH can be very organ specific too in an organism. So this is also same, there is a range called optimum range. Now, as you can see, in case of human, there are different enzymes which, which can uh, have very different uh, curve based on the region they are working. So, as you can see, this arginase works in the intestine, small intestine. Whereas salivary amylase in mouth, pepsin in stomach. So in stomach, its range is two. In mouth, its range is 6.8. And in uh, small intestine, it can even means reach to 9.6. So, in one organism, there can be a lot of variation in the uh, pH activity. Now there are some questions, or you'll get some so many different types of questions from this region. Suppose an enzyme is having this kind of curve. So what is the difference between enzyme E1 and enzyme E2? So if the question asks, 
difference between E1 and E2 You know the difference is like okay the optimum temperature is different but what is the actual difference in the enzyme uh, why these enzymes are different what should be the answer how how one enzyme is so stable that it can work in this high temperature region uh, sir, more hydrogen bonds in the enzyme or similar bonds. Is, more, is this more hydrogen bond or some other kind of bond? The difference in gives free energy in these two enzymes. Uh, gives free energy. There's more number of disulfide bonds. Yes, 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 yes. Very good. So, see, the gives free energy also depends on the overall structure of the molecule. So, now if the structure is different, more stable, so it will be having uh, different uh, potential energy. But how or what are the factors that are contributing to its uh, stability? So, most important point is, obviously, E2 will be having more, E2 has more disulfide bonds more uh, but sir disulfide bonds are more present in the quaternary structure right sir and most enzymes are in the tertiary structure then how is the disulfide mm -hmm. quaternary structures uh disulfide is must for the uh connection between two tertiary structures but but nowhere it is written like uh disulfides cannot be there in uh in tertiary right so even okay. if in the tertiary structure, there will be so many different kind of uh, uh, different disulfides. So this is the basic difference between uh, EU bacteria and RK bacteria. That's that's how uh, those you know those thermoacidophiles. There are some bacteria, RK bacteria. So they can they can survive in those high high temperature uh, regions, means thermal uh, springs, hot springs. So E2 has more disulfide linkage than E1. This is one thing for sure we can say from the uh, curve. So uh, substrate concentration. So if you increase the concentration of the substrate, enzyme should work faster and faster because uh, so there are a lot of substrate for the means it took after keeping other parameters constant, say temperature, pH, everything uh, optimal, op, ep, everything in optimal range. If we increase the concentration of substrate, concentration of substrate. then uh, the activity or the uh, velocity of reaction should increase so it should increase 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 but at one time, it reaches a uh, saturation point. So, so for every enzyme, there is there is a point which is the uh, maximum velocity of for that reaction. So say enzyme E1 is uh, converting A into B. Now, when you are increasing the concentration of A, uh, the 
rate can increase up to a certain extent. And that extent is the uh, maximum velocity of that reaction. So, so this is the saturation point. Uh, that means beyond this concentration, we don't uh, need any more substrate because it will not increase uh, the velocity of the reaction. So now there, uh, there are two scientists, uh, Michaelis and Menten. There is a Michaelis Menten equation too, but I'll provide that in the uh, question. So there are two scientists, Michaelis and Menten. They found out a very uh, unique a uh, way to characterize uh, enzyme. So to, to give enzyme a specific character that this is the very constant uh, thing for one enzyme. They found out like if, if we just uh, reduce this V max to its half, say V max by two, and then to plot so first you just do the reaction and plot it in your uh, practical lab copy. So normally what uh, any in any biochemistry class people do, they plot the reaction curve and then, and then they find out the uh, half value of the uh, Vmax and then plot it into the curve, say, if you just plot it, you will see where it is bisecting the, so where it is intersecting this curve. And then you just come down and check the substrate concentration. So this specific substrate concentration, Michaelis and Menten, after a lot of experiment, they found out that this substrate concentration is a, a specific number for a for an enzyme. So every enzyme, uh, for for each enzyme, this number is constant. It means uh, they they always achieves a V max by two in that specific substrate concentration. So that this substrate concentration is a constant value on a universal constant for the specific enzyme. And they named it uh, KM, KM value. KM is also called Michaelis Menten constant. Michaelis and Menten constant. Now, <clears throat> Now let's check uh, KM value, just, just to know that KM value is what? Is a measure of enzyme efficiency. Enzyme efficiency. That means if you have three enzymes, say EA, EB, EC, there are three enzymes. Suppose uh, a pharmaceutical company is uh, uh, tweaking some protein to act on a specific molecule. So there are so many medicines which, which mimics enzyme. So uh, say, <laughs> So I'm I'm just uh, writing a question. Say, so just uh, read this question. So the question says like this: that a pharmaceutical company uh, 
developed three uh, enzymes in the lab. Three enzymes in a lab, say for a specific substrate. For a specific substrate, say P. The name of the substrate is P. Uh, which will be used in a, uh, a pill correcting a hormonal disorder. So for a hormonal disorder, a pill has been developed in a um, pharmaceutical company and they have first drafted three, three different enzymes. Now, the enzymes are given, uh, say, EA, EB, and EC. And if uh, the KM value is given, so I'm just making the question very easier, but if the KM value is given that EA is having, say, Five microliter per liter. So to say this is the uh, 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 EA value. But that means a KM value of the first enzyme. Second enzyme is say three point five microliter. Third enzyme is say three microliter. So. Among all these enzymes, which one is more efficient? So the last one. Yes. Yes, sir, the last one. So the last so, one. So the K KM. Okay, so KM is inversely proportional to the efficiency. So more so if the K Yes, uh, what? If, if the KM value is less for any particular enzyme, then it states that or it interprets that at low concentration of the substrate, it reaches its uh, velocity half, half of its maximum level. Yeah, yeah. So hence it should be efficient. So, yeah. So very low concentration in very, so the binding is very uh, specific or very good in case of the, uh, when, when KM is very low. So the binding is uh, very specific among all other substrates. Uh, now there is an equation, just uh, let me know uh, in the group. So, so that when I prepare the question, I can include the equation. So now uh, we have okay. Now we can come to uh, international union of biochemistry. So now classification of enzyme. Okay. So uh, so enzyme classification has been uh, developed by uh, International Union of Biochemistry. And uh, they have uh, uh, developed something called Enzyme Commission. And then according to Enzyme Commission, there is something called EC number. 
So enzyme commission number. And the numbers are very specific from one to six. So there is, uh, just to remember, I think uh, many of you know already, so just remember it like oath lil. So this is kind of a mnemonic, but you, you need to, uh, because if uh, EC number two, you should only specify transfer is. So these are the enzyme commission number and uh, the names are like, uh, oxidoreductase and then transferase. So we cannot change the order in which we are reading the uh, names. Hydrolase, lyase, isomerase, and ligase. I'll come to the uh, functions. Just, just know that uh, enzyme, in case of any enzyme, it is written by this four number. So any enzyme is written in such a way that there are four numbers. Now, four numbers followed by a dot. Now, the first number denotes the class. And the class we know that oxidoreductase, transferase, hydrolase. So, there are only six classes. And there can be uh, 12 subclasses. I think it's also given in NCRT. There are four to 12 subclasses. So, so when so the second number after a dot is the subclass. And the third number, so, so as you can see, the number can be double digit number two. So the third number denotes sub subclass. And finally, it is the entry in the, uh, means just a sequence by which they were uh, included in the classification system. So as you can see that three, three is obviously hydrolase from Othlil. And four is, uh, that means hydrolase, now it is protein digesting, peptide bond. So protein digesting enzymes should start with 3.4. And then there are like, as you can see, 21, uh, it is uh, acting on a serine, uh, enzyme, uh, sorry, serine uh, amino acid uh, peptides and this is subclass. So I don't, just, just to know that there are a class, subclass, sub subclass and the entry in the commissions, uh, Dictionary uh, system. Sir, four denotes what? Four denotes the entry in the subclass. That means uh, there is. Uh, so, when all the enzymes were uh, being discovered and all those enzymes were written, so you can just think it like uh, Carolus Linnaeus book where uh, new plant species, new animal species were being added. So similarly, when new enzymes were being discovered, they were uh, added to the uh, subclass randomly. So um, those uh, entries were given the last number. Okay, so this is a uh, important uh, table. So I'll not go to all the single lines here. Just, this is very simple. This is kind of uh, mugging type of topic. 
So oxidoreductase, transferase. So you can understand that dehydrogenase is the major group of oxidoreductase. So dehydrogenase is the major subclass. In transferase, kinase is one of the most important because you will find kinase throughout uh, the uh, class 11 biology topics, kinase. Hydrolase is overall important because it is digestive enzyme. So all kind of, either it is lipid digesting, protein digesting, carbohydrate digesting. So um, lies, I'll give one example now, very important example. I'll see that. Isomerase, like is So basically this, okay, fine. Just take some time. So so class one, just uh, class one, class two, three, four, five, and six. So first group is just doing uh, oxidation and reduction. Still I'm writing something. Not necessary, but still, okay, fine. Oxidation. So obviously, oxidation of one substrate and reduction of another substrate. So from the from the definition, you should know that this type of enzymes works. It, it requires two substrate. So the two substrate will bind to the active site and then one substrate will be oxidized and another substrate will be uh, reduced. Similarly, if you see transferase, it also uh, require two substrate because transfer of one group from one substrate to another. So transfer of a group from one substrate to another. Uh, then we have hydrolase. Hydrolase one substrate is enough. So for hydrolase one substrate. So hydrolysis or breakdown of bond. So breakdown of chemical bond using H2O, hydrolysis. Now this lyase is also one substrate. And and in, in, in case of lyase also there is breakdown. Breakdown of chemical bond. But without using, without using water. And there is a specific mention in NCERT that after this breakdown, there will be double bond in the original substrate. leaving double bond. So you can just refer to NCERT that for this. Five, uh, isomerase. So obviously this is also one substrate. Mm -hmm. A simple isomerization reaction. That means glucose to fructose, uh, fructose to galactose, And uh, for ligase, you need minimum two substrate. So this joining of chemical bonds. 
Now this is almost like uh, uh, opposite to three. In three, using water, so oh, bonds were getting, uh, bonds were breaking. Now in case of uh, six means ligase, joining of chemical bond and uh, forming water. H2 will be formed in these reactions. So these are like condensation reaction. So this is just going to take enzyme. On. Okay, so Li is one example. Uh, if any any one of you have already completed the chapter respiration in plants, there is something called glycolysis. In glycolysis, uh, the first step is catalyzed by enzyme. What's the name? Anyone? Hexokinase. Hexokinase. So kinase, that means what's the group? What's the class? Kinase. Kinase always transfers phosphate. It transfers. Transferase. So you know the glucose is converted into glucose 6-phosphate. So from where this phosphate came, phosphate came from ATP. So from ATP, one group is being transferred to glucose and ATP becomes ADP and the last phosphate of ATP goes to glucose. So this is kinase. So, so it needs two, two uh, substrate and it, it is transferase. So like this, when you move to the second step, uh, second step was what? Isomerase, glucose 6 phosphate 2 fructose. So how uh, two substrates are required? Uh, let's repeat this thing. Yeah, because it, it needs to transfer one group from one substrate to another. So if there is one substrate in its active site, then to whom it will transfer the group? Got it right. So the second second uh, reaction is catalyzed by isomerase, which is class five. Third reaction is again kinase, phosphofructokinase. You will find it. One three bis uh, fructose one six bis phosphate. Just I'm just writing one six bis phosphate. So there are two phosphate now again kinase transferase. So the fourth one is lyase. If you just go and check the fourth reaction. Yeah, yes, sir. Aldo. Aldo. Aldo lays. Aldo lays. Yes. So the exam, this uh, enzyme is Aldo lays. And this is an important example of lays. Here, without using water, no water, but this fructose 1,6 base phosphate is broken down into two molecule. What are Red the molecules? Glycerol D3 phosphate and the DHAP and uh, glycerol dehyde. So glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So 3 phosphate, no? Yeah. This is 3 phosphate. 
No sir, dihydroxy uh, dihydroxy acetone three phosphate. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we normally write it as DHAP. So here, uh, normally we don't include uh, the number. That's why we write it like G3P and DHAP. Okay, so this, this enzyme is a uh, good example of lyase. Otherwise, uh, there are not much lyase example in means from our NCRT or uh, class 11 syllabus. Other, other enzymes are like very common. You'll find every now and then. Oh. Uh, so as I, I would not be able to touch the hormone part, so let's go to enzyme inhibition, which is very important. Now let's, maybe I'll take 15 moments. So enzyme is like a, uh, alloy you can say so if, if you have a proper uh, say proper uh, metal very pure metal still this uh, you know the metals pure metals are weaker you need to adulterate it with, it with something to make it stronger so enzyme is also like this the functional enzyme is called hollow enzyme This is the functional enzyme. But in this enzyme, only a simple part is protein part. And the other part is non-protein. Protein part is EPO. Non-protein part is cofactor. So EPO enzyme and cofactor. Now this cofactors, there are three types of cofactors. And these are very important, coenzymes. Prosthetic group. and metal ion. You all know this or you'll just, uh, this is very basic things. But first, which we need to know is coenzyme. It is very important to know about coenzymes because uh, <clears throat> these are usually derived from vitamins. So the vitamins we are taking, especially uh, water-soluble vitamins like B and C, those can, uh, from those structures, coenzymes can be derived. And the coenzymes are, uh, these are free structures in the cytoplasm or any means in the protoplasm specifically not protoplasm covers every area so these are free compounds in the protoplasm but during uh, catalysis during the reaction process it it gets bound to the enzyme and uh, helps enzyme to do its task so it binds transiently, so for a very short period, to the EPO enzyme. And helps in uh, completing the catalysis process.
so the uh, so the uh, obviously catalyzes the faster uh, making the reaction faster so now <clears throat> so there is a structure very common structure called nad which you will find in so many chapters photosynthesis respiration now this nad is usually uh, called a uh, hydrogen carrier so it can bind to hydrogen and carry it from one reaction to another reaction in a different time period and it's a very large structure because it has two nucleotide one nucleotide is composed of what like sugar uh, phosphate and then nitrogenous base so the whole structure is a very big structure so nicotinamide and then it has the nitrogenous base adenine and then it has two nucleotide structure with adenine and it normally carries hydrogen in a reaction however this type of molecule the nicotinamide is derived from a vitamin From vitamin B, which one? B1? Sorry, I think B3. B3, yes. B3. Yeah, B3 is niacin. So the chemical name of vitamin B3 is niacin. And nicotinamide, this NAD is derived from vitamin B3. And, and there is another structure you'll find in uh, photosynthesis chapter only and this is FAD. FAD stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide. And FAD is also derived from a vitamin. Which one? This is also another uh, B vitamin. This is B2. The chemical name of B2 is riboflavin. Riboflavin. Riboflavin, yeah. So, same. Uh, if you see another... The structure name is coenzyme A, like acetyl CoA. Acetyl coenzyme A. We'll find this in uh, respiration, mitochondria. So the name itself has coenzyme written. So coenzyme A is derived from which vitamin? B B5 pentothenic acid so every uh, so B1 B2 B3 uh, B5 say 679 Seven, nine, B twelve. All this B complex. X uh, in some form of uh, coenzyme for a for an enzyme for a apoenzyme. So coenzymes are so important. Prosthetic group. I'll not go to that much detail. Just you know that it is tightly bound to the apoenzyme. So it is always 
and tightly bound to apoenzym. So you, you cannot detach it. So it has no other work except uh, catalysis. And the most important thing is both prosthetic group and metal ion forms coordinate bond. Coordinate bond. Sometimes with substrate. That means they are part of active site, active site of enzyme. So this uh, prosthetic group and metal ions are usually part of the active site of the enzyme. Now, enzymes can be inhibited in two different ways. There are other ways, but uh, every other aspects are covered in these two ways. So, competitive or non-competitive. In competitive type of inhibition, substrate and inhibitor competes for the so substrate and inhibitor competes for the same active site. So for this competition, the inhibitor must have similar uh, three-dimensional structure as that of substrate. So almost similar molecular structure. As that of substrate. Whereas in case of non-competitive, uh, inhibitor binds to an allosteric site. So non-competitive, uh, you need that allosteric site. So usually you need to have a lot of uh, inhibitor for competitive inhibition to occur because means there is a competition like which one is having more concentration. So the any uh, if the inhibitor has higher concentration, it it will effectively uh, inhibit the enzyme. So basically, I'll just. Uh, draw two curve to understand this two uh, inhibition. In case of, of competitive inhibition, you'll find that if uh, this is the normal, say if this is the normal enzyme substrate reaction, so this is substrate concentration, this is enzyme activity, So if you, so this is like normal. Uh, so this is enzyme plus substrate. And uh, there is another curve. This is enzyme plus 
substrate plus inhibitor. So in the second curve, you can observe that with time, slowly this curve is catching up with the first curve. That means, that means it, it reached that V max value. So it reached that V max value. So in why? Because you are increasing the substrate concentration. So as you are increasing substrate, substrate is winning over inhibitor. So, so the whole game play is regarding the concentration. So if the concentration of substrate is very high, then obviously it will win in this competition uh, to the same active site. So as they are competing for the same active site, so when you are increasing substrate concentration to a very high number, so obviously it will catch up to the uh, normal uh, Vmax value. But just try to understand that if, if this is Vmax, okay, and then, and, and if it is Vmax by two, Vmax is same for both. But V max by two, which one is having lower? So you can see the Km value for normal enzyme, say N. Km value for N is lower than the Km value with inhibitor. So when there was inhibitor, you can say that in case of competitive inhibition, Vmax remains same. Vmax doesn't change because at one time it will obviously reach if you keep on increasing the substrate concentration. But the Vmax value, v, sorry, uh, Km value, Km value, increases. So in competitive inhibition, Vmax remains same, but the Km value increases. Very important. Whereas in non-competitive inhibition, the same if, if we see the curve for non-competitive, So in non-competitive, what will happen? Say so this is the normal curve. As the inhibitor is not competing with substrate. So as the inhibitor is not at all in competition with the substrate, it will directly reduce the uh, V max value because the enzymes say this is this is an enzyme and this is an allosteric site. So this is active site and this is allosteric site and here an inhibitor inhibitor is bound so as as soon as inhibitor is bound to that region the active site will be gone you'll see that the active site is not able to means active site is not properly visible so even if there is lot of substrate they will not be able to do any reaction So with enzyme with enzyme inhibitor complex, this the whole enzyme will not be able to work at all. 
in case of non competitive inhibition so what will happen the, as there are a lot of enzymes which are not able to work the uh, this uh, curve will settle in a much lower vmax value so it will not be able to reach that original vmax now with so many enzymes not working at all even if you increase the substrate concentration so in this case sorry i just uh, just write it like this so in this case you just see uh, the vmax of original so this is vmax of original and this is vmax by 2 of original okay and this is vmax of the inhibited area vmax and this is vmax of the inhibited now if you look at it usually what happens their km value coincide with each other km coincides because the enzymes which were not inhibited they will work with their proper efficiency with their normal efficiency but the all those enzymes which were inhibited they are not working at all so the maximum is getting affected however the efficiency is not getting affected so in case of non competitive very important point so in case of non competitive km remains same whereas vmax decreases oh shit okay so uh, if there is any question then just ask past past